Subsequently, the testing revealed that baby A was genetically matched to couple A and baby B was genetically matched to couple B. As a result, plaintiffs were required to relinquish custody of baby A and baby B, thus suffering the loss of two children. Oh, that part just like breaks my that heart. That breaks so my much. heart. I like tearing up a little bit here. This is a community supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. Let's do the wrong embryo case next. Sure. How about Yay! That? To please tactical. So stick with me a little bit here, guys, because they've written the complaint a little bit obtusely. I, I'm not saying they did anything wrong here. They did it very technically. Everything is written in this plaintiffs are citizens of New York. Plaintiffs are utilizing their initials. Pla at all times relevant. At all times. They do this very formally, and that's fine. It's not an, an incorrect way to, to, to write a complaint. However, it does kind of take the story or prose out of it, and that's why some lawyers, again, just, a, just an opinion, disagreement here, but that's why some lawyers like me will write these things in a much more prosaic form, you know, a much more story-based form, trying to get the story across, and then just make sure that any extra facts that we need are all incorporated at the bottom. Defendant CHA Fertility is a medical facility with a principal place of business in Los Angeles, California, and they help individuals conceive through IVF. In vitro. In vitro, thank you very much. I knew someone would jump in there with it. So we can sort of skip ahead a little bit because of the obtuse wording of the complaint. Defendants held themselves out as experts in the field of IVF. Defendants collected, fertilized, and stored plaintiff's genetic material in their premises located in Los Angeles. Defendant knew that plaintiffs resided in New York and intended to reside in New York for the duration of the IVF procedure and subsequent pregnancy. Plaintiffs were married on August 6, 2012. From the time of their marriage through the present, plaintiffs desired to conceive, deliver, and raise children of their own. Plaintiffs' attempt to conceive a child through natural measures were unsuccessful. As a result, plaintiffs sought alternative measures to conceive a child, including artificial insemination. Unfortunately, despite their attempts at natural and alternative measures, plaintiffs were unable to conceive a child. In or around late 2018, plaintiffs learned of CHA fertility and their reported success in IVF. Plaintiffs reviewed the CHA fertility website and promotional advertisements in deciding whether to consider defendants for their infertility treatment. Defendant's website represents that CHA Fertility is one of the premier fertility treatment networks in the world. Defendants are known as the mecca of reproductive medicine with world-class treatments for infertility. Defendants ensure each patient receives the most appropriate and advanced treatment necessary. Defendants understand every patient is unique, and we pride ourselves on providing the highest degree of personalized care delivered with the utmost sense of duty. Defendants helped thousands of international aspiring parents from over 20 countries. Their level of care combined with our laboratory expertise allows us to achieve a high rate of success. Defendants have purposefully availed themselves of the benefits of doing business in the state of New York. This is for jurisdictional purposes. It was these representations, among other things, that caused plaintiffs to select CHA for their IVF services. On or about January 9, 2018, plaintiffs traveled to CHA Fertility in Los Angeles to meet with employees of CHA Fertility. At that meeting, they discussed the IVF process, including the risks. They intended to have embryos created using plaintiffs' eggs and another person's sperm. Plaintiffs' desires were and intent were clearly, unequivocally, and repeatedly documented, as, as should be done. After meeting with defendants' representatives, plaintiffs ent entered into a contract. Plaintiffs paid substantial amounts of money for the IVF services, including but not limited to facility fees, specialist services, medication, doctor's fees, lab laboratory expenses, travel expenses, and other related costs and fees in excess of $100,000. Plaintiff was provided a specific schedule for growing her eggs, including the use of medications and vitamins, monitoring of ovarian response, submitting to blood testing and ultrasound examinations. They produced sperm and conducted a sperm analysis, and they retrieved the egg 
After the sperm and egg donations were completed, the process continued and embryos were formed. Subsequently, the embryos were tested, including pre-implantation genetic screening performed by Pac Genomics Genetics Laboratory. According to the report, eight embryos were tested and five were determined to be euploidy and another three aneuploidy. I don't know what those mean. Euploidy means the appropriate number of chromosomes, and aneuploidy means the wrong number. Okay. Of the five euploidy, four were female and one male. Oh, on two different dates, all eight were cryopreserved. This procedure was performed by one of the defendants, and then she followed the IVF protocol, various medications, prenatal vitamins, etc., they went to the facility to undergo an ultrasound guided embryo replacement of one of, of one of her embryos. This transfer was performed under the direction of the defendants. The transfer did not result in a pregnancy. Plaintiffs decided they wanted to try again. They thawed two female embryos for transfer to plaintiff. Plaintiff traveled back to undergo the implantation. The two embryo transfers were performed under the direction and care of the defendants. They confirmed on September 17th, 2018, that she was pregnant with twins. So, the story ends there. Congratulations, Everyone's everyone. happy. Happy ending. I wish. Plaintiffs were ecstatic to learn that after years of trying to conceive, they had success and were pregnant with twins. Plaintiffs continued to follow the medical advice of her physicians. After the three and five month sonogram, they advised plaintiffs that she was carrying two boys. They were confused by the results, since according to the defendants, only one male embryo existed and it had not been transferred to her. The plaintiffs called the defendants to discuss the sonogram results. They advised plaintiffs that the sonogram results were not accurate and that it was not a definitive test. During both calls, defendants confirmed that the genetic testing revealed five embryos, four female and one male. In a further effort to conceal from plaintiffs that the sonogram was wrong, defendant Berger explained that when his wife was pregnant, they were told they were having a boy, but ultimately had a girl. They assured plaintiffs that they were having girls and that nothing was wrong. Plaintiffs relied on the defendant's testimony or, or statements and accepted the representations. March 30th, 2019, so I guess that's just this year, a plaintiff was admitted to the hospital, gave birth via cesarean section to two male babies, neither of which was of Asian descent, which I'm assuming was the ethnicity of, of the, uh, the plaintiffs in this case. Plaintiffs were shocked to see that the babies they were told were formed using both their genetic material did not appear to be. Plaintiffs called Dr. Berger to advise him that plaintiff had delivered two male babies that did not appear to be of the correct descent. On or about April 2nd, 2019, the defendants traveled to New York to meet with plaintiffs at the hospital. At the defendant's request, plaintiffs agreed to submit themselves and the babies to DNA testing to confirm their beliefs. The testing confirmed that they, the plaintiffs, are not genetically related to the two male babies. The testing also confirmed that the two male babies were not genetically related to each other. Unbeknownst to plaintiffs at the time, defendants investigated the matter and contacted two other couples who went for treatment at CHA. Subsequently, the testing revealed that baby A was genetically matched to couple A and baby B was genetically matched to couple B. As a result, plaintiffs were required to relinquish custody of baby A and baby B, thus suffering the loss of two children. I'm sure that was fun. Oh, that part just, like, breaks my that heart. That breaks my so heart. Much. I like tearing up a little bit here. Plaintiffs have suffered significant and permanent emotional injuries for which they will not recover. In addition, plaintiff underwent physical and emotional injuries for which she is still under the treatment of medical providers and will continue to be in the future. Defendants have not advised plaintiffs what happened to the plaintiff's own two embryos that were supposed to be transferred on August 20th, 2018. Upon information and belief, the two female embryos that plaintiffs believe were transferred to plaintiff were never thawed and were lost or destroyed by defendants. Defendants are continuing to wrongfully conceal the whereabouts of plaintiffs' two embryos that we know were not transferred to plaintiff. So they, uh, they allege medical malpractice 
which, yeah, this would definitely be some kind of major negligence in the practice of medicine, and that's what we call medical malpractice. Negligence, there's the negligence part. They have a duty of care, and they breach that duty of care. Uh, negligent infliction of emotional distress, that's a pretty, it's a pretty easy one, I think. Um, obviously mom has suffered, and I'm assuming dad too, but, but uh, you know, especially mom has suffered a lot of emotional distress from, from that. Uh, certainly you allege intentional, even if it was an accident, uh, you know, you want to you get that in there and let the chips fall where they may. Reckless and wanton misconduct, so some, some sort of gross negligence or reckless, reckless misconduct uh, that they knew, should have known, um, or, or, or acted in willful disregard or in reckless disregard of, of their duties and uh, to, duties to plaintiff and that uh, they caused damage to plaintiffs. Especially if they knew before she gave birth, like if she knew early, if they knew early in the pregnancy that something had gone wrong, because when she said like, look, we're having two boys, if they did any internal investigation yeah. oh, and wow. then they let her continue the pregnancy oh, my thinking goodness. it was her embryos, then like that's, yeah. there, there's an extra layer there that I think it's important that they allege in the initial complaint. That's just one of the weirdest legal situations I've heard of so far. If the doctor negligently, or worse, implants the wrong embryo in you, but finds out right away, however, now, now you've got a set of parents who have a viable embryo, and they could have this child through this sort of non-consensual surrogate, who did consent to having her own embryo implanted in her, but not somebody else's. So what do you do? Do you ask the, the, the victim? Well, I guess the victims are all the different families. Do you ask the woman carrying the embryo to, like, carry your child to term so that you, your desperate parents, can have, and I mean desperate, you know, compassionately, who can have a, a you know, this child that you've longed for, you know, and, and worked so hard to, to be able to, to have. Uh, meanwhile, the the mother who, who's carrying this embryo, that some other person's embryo, has to decide, do I terminate this embryo that is basically priceless to this to this couple? Because it's a viable, it's a viable fertilized embryo. Maybe you can get another one, but you you, you don't ever know if you're going to be able to get another one. You got one now. It's basically priceless. So, holy mackerel! <laughs> For women, in terms of donating uh, eggs, um, it's possible to become infertile after the uh, egg donation process because they basically pump you up with a bunch of hormones oh and get goodness. you to release a bunch of eggs all at once, and um oh, wow. so so sometimes you can it's it's one of the risks is permanent infertility so yeah i feel i feel for them um breach of contract definitely because there was a contract and the contract was for their own for plaintiff's embryos to be implanted in plaintiff seventh count breach of implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing there is a implied covenant or an implied duty to conduct your execution of your duties under the contract with good faith and and fair dealing under the contract and and not to i don't know you, you can imagine someone acting antagonistically you know within the letter of their agreement but but not within sort of the good faith of their agreement and so that's what they're saying here uh, breach of fiduciary duty so we've talked about this before a fiduciary is someone who must give you advice in your own best interest. Uh, we can compare a accountant who must give you financial advice in your own best interest or a lawyer who must give you legal advice in your own best interest or a doctor who must give you medical advice in your own best interest. So they're saying that the doctor has breached their fiduciary duty because they owe such a duty to plaintiffs that they must exercise that duty with care and good faith. They breached that duty by failing to collect, store, thaw, and transfer the embryos and possibly not communicating with them at the proper time. They also allege violations of consumer protection laws, basic common law misrepresentation, which is sort of a, a kind of a fraud. 
a breach of duty to disclose, that they had a duty to disclose the medical information, the mistake that they made, which, which was medical in nature and, you know, affected the health and safety. Uh, so informed consent before giving someone the wrong embryo, basically. Yeah, they probably did not get warned. By the way, there's a chance we could, you know, give you the wrong embryos. It probably was not on the list yeah. of risks. So bailment, Tactical and I were talking about this before. Bailment's an interesting one. Bailment basically means that they had some sort of duty to keep the embryos in custody and safe and all that. Uh, we learned about this in, I think it's property law. If you give somebody, if you say, if you're, if you're, let's say you're at a party and you have to run out for something and you just say, you know, hey, can I leave my bag here? Will you watch it for a moment? And someone says, yeah, sure, I'll watch your bag or whatever. And you return to the party and your bag's gone. And let's, for, for simplicity's sake, let's say that your bag and its contents were simply worth $500 or whatever. Well, you might be able to go after that person who said that they would watch your bag because they obviously didn't watch your bag. And it's one thing if they didn't have any duty to watch your bag and you just unreasonably expected them to. But it's another thing if you said, hey, would you please watch my bag? And they go, yeah, sure, I'll watch your bag. And then the bag disappears. So that's what bailment is. And so on a different level, obviously, because this is an embryo, they had a duty to keep the uh, embryo safe and cryo frozen and to you know implant it in the right person and all that and they didn't do that so let's see battery that is an offensive offensive bodily contact that's basically a, an invasion of your of your bodily integrity and then another interesting one here conversion which is sort of like theft. They've converted property to their own. And I'm assuming this is about the, the two embryos. Yeah, the two embryos that were not transferred and have not, they, no one's explained where they are. So that's akin to theft, sure. I can see that. Deceit and fraudulent concealment, that they marketed and promoted their services, that they could do these things and that they didn't. Plaintiffs relied on their representations that defendants intentionally suppressed and concealed material facts. Defendants had Apple means and opportunity to alert or warn plaintiffs, and defendants were under a duty to disclose, and they didn't. So some of that's a little bit repetitive, but that's uh, really interesting, and I have a feeling that those doctors, medical malpractice insurance companies are going to be stepping up to... Uh, help take care or at least try to take care of this lawsuit this is pretty egregious i don't know what the damages would be here if you if on one hand if it had been a consensual surrogate relationship there is some legal precedent for an amount of around 30 to maybe a hundred thousand dollars for surrogacy services it could be more than that but there is some point at which it's too much where we don't want to you know, I don't know. I'm assuming there's a point where it's too much. I, can't, I couldn't tell yeah, you all of it. Yeah, it becomes coercive. Yeah, it, there you the go. The incentive is so high, it's coercive. I don't imagine this is something where you simply say, okay, well, we'll give you $100,000 times three for your trouble. I, I don't know if $300,000 cuts it for the trouble of, of, of birthing via cesarean section, which... I'm not going to get into which is worse, but one's cutting you open, one's stretching you open. So she's had surgery at this point to give birth to children that she never consented to have put in her body. I think she's pretty violated. And then I hate to, you know, I'm not, I don't want to take anything away from mom here, but there is a dad. I think dad's hurt too. Dad was expecting to be a dad and is now had the, basically the children that, that, that mom, you know, birthed have been taken away in front of him. Uh, I don't know. That's pretty horrible, too. I think mom's damages are, are, are physical. Uh, I think both of them are emotional. I mean, they paid over $100,000 for these, uh, for all of the treatments. So, I mean, $100,000 is just basically covering your costs to have used. And they still don't know where the treatment. actual embryos are, yeah. So if this isn't in the millions, I would be shocked. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't see how it's how it's not. So thank you for joining us. That is our show. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. 
Thank you to our patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsus.org slash law supporters. Your financial support makes this entire thing possible. We, uh, we do a lot of work for you here, but I want to let you go. So thank you very much to our $500 supporter for the month of July, Joshua Davis from Tandapay. We'll be making a video about his social insurance program that uses blockchain technology. Thank you to our $50 plus supporters, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudrock, Evie, Michael Pierce, Richard Fournier, Spirit Bear, Jan Negray, Daniel Perez, and Snorri Wazatsky. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who are on the LED panel behind me and in the description of the videos below. I'll leave some room here for dog video. Love you all. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Have a great week. Thank you to Brandon and Tactical in the virtual studio today, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.